This video is brought to you by Nano, creators of virtual reality tools for immersive molecular visualization and interaction. Follow the link in the video description to download Nano and explore molecules yourself. All right, tertiary structure. So we already mentioned that tertiary structure refers to the overall folded 3D structure, otherwise known as the native conformation. And of course, this includes mainly the, the, the key thing to keep in mind is the side chains, right? Interactions between the side chains, and that could be hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, electrostatic interactions, and disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges. Relationships between secondary structures, which includes motifs or supersecondary structures, and also the involvement of any prosthetic groups, like, like, like heme and hemoglobin, okay? So when it comes to tertiary structure, it's important to understand one thing that I want to mention is that there are two types of proteins, okay? There are um there are fibrous proteins which just the skinny on them the long story short is that with them the polypeptide does not fold back upon itself these are rod like proteins uh, and examples include collagen elastin keratin they're all meant for structural support they're kind of like long fibers little rods um and their 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 purpose is they serve a structural purpose okay um the other type of protein uh, which is most proteins are globular proteins and most proteins or enzymes are globular proteins okay they're they're literally exactly what they sound like they're um they're little globs okay the polypeptide does fold back on itself so you don't get this long rod like fiber instead you have this long string that eventually folds into some sort of glob kind of like a ball compact and spherical most of them are water soluble because they end up in um I mean, we're as as humans and other animals, they're, we're like seventy percent water, and so almost any protein that's in our bodies is dissolved in an aqueous environment, and so um, almost all of these these globular proteins are water soluble or hydrophilic. Okay, some examples would include hemoglobin, myoglobin, and pretty much any enzyme you can think of. Okay, um, there are some that exist in nonpolar environments and thus their surfaces are nonpolar. Okay. Um, and they are lipid soluble. Those are, there are a few of them like that. Okay. Um, okay. So let's talk about the interactions that stabilize tertiary structure and we'll start with hydrophobic interactions. Okay. So let's scroll down here. So when it comes to hydrophobic interactions, this is basically that, um, when nonpolar or hydrophobic portions or side chains basically remain buried in a protein's interior, not exposed to the hydrophilic environment. So if you imagine a protein as like a ball, in fact, imagine it kind of like an orange, okay? Um, an orange has its peel, which covers its surface, and then it has the fruity portion on the inside. That fruity portion is not exposed to the outside so long as that orange is not cut open. But if you imagine a slice of an orange, looks kind of like this. You have the slice, you have the peel right there. And then you have the, the fruity interior, okay? And the fruity part on the inside. So if you imagine a protein to kind of be like a, an orange, um, the surface um, is exposed to the outside, the air, okay? Um, and it, with proteins, that surface is exposed typically to water. And so what ends up happening is that the, the side chains that have uh, the polar side chains tend to hang out sort of on the exterior to interact with the polar water environment, okay? Uh, whereas the nonpolar or hydrophobic portions tend to be buried inside of the, the protein, not really exposed to that, that water on, on the outside, okay? Um, and that's for most globular proteins. Let's take a quick look at the interior of this hemoglobin. If we look inside here, some of these portions are highlighted blue, whereas the rest of it is red. The blue portions I specifically highlighted because they are hydrophobic residues. So let's actually go inside here. So we can see here, these portions are blue. This is a leucine here, and this is also a leucine over here. Uh, and if we go inside, we can see some more blue portions on the interior. Um, here, for example, we've got an alanine, also hydrophobic. Um, and over here, we got another uh, leucine. So the point is that all of these hydrophobic residues are on the interior of the protein. And that makes sense given that hemoglobin is a protein that is dissolved in the blood, which of course is an aqueous environment. So 
the hydrophobic residues don't want to interact with that aqueous environment. So they'll kind of bury themselves in uh, the, uh, the interior um, of this protein, right? Sort of away from the water. Now there are some where the opposite is true, okay? Um, and on the surface, you'd have those nonpolar side chains. But that's kind of the case for uh, proteins that are embedded in lipid soluble uh, areas, namely membrane proteins, right? Because um, a membrane, you have the, um, it's a lipid bilayer, so it looks something like this. So you have these phospholipids, and they look something like this. So this is um, a membrane here, and so if you have a protein that's embedded in here, uh, the surfaces, if I just draw this like a protein like in purple here, if I have a protein that's embedded in a membrane, then the portions here in this region that I'm shading in here, they're exposed to that lipid soluble environment and thus the surface, the amino acids on the surface of that protein would, th that are interacting with that hydrophobic environment are going to be nonpolar amino acids, nonpolar side chains. Okay. So, um, this idea of like dissolves like is important for how a protein folds and the overall structure it takes on. Okay. So next up, hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds, now in this case, we're, we're talking about hydrogen, hydrogen bonds specifically that are between the R groups or between the side chains. Okay. Um, and so just to name a couple examples of, of uh, amino acids that have um, that hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond a lot, uh, are the ones with OH groups, so serine, threonine, and tyrosine, though they're not the only ones. As asparagine and glutamine can, can hydrogen bond to a certain extent with their amide groups and their carbonyls um, and nitrogens and whatnot. The point is, though, that when we're talking about hydrogen bonds, as w when, uh, when it comes to tertiary structure, we're talking about them between the R groups, okay, between the side chains, not between... Um, the atoms of the backbone. So it's different from secondary structure hydrogen bonds because those are um, part of the backbone, not the hydrogen, not the um, not the side chains. Okay. So right here we've got, for example, a glutamine, and right next to it we've got a lysine. So both of these residues can participate in a hydrogen bond, and they happen to be close enough to each other that there may actually be a hydrogen bond holding these two together. And that interaction is important, sort of locally holding this region together, right? Uh, but you can imagine that uh, I've actually highlighted all the different areas in this blue glowing highlight to basically show the residues that can hydrogen bond. So there could be a lot of different hydrogen bonds holding this overall structure together. All right, next up is uh, electrostatic interactions. Okay. So electrostatic interactions are just the idea that charged polar groups will either attract or repel. So like charges repel while opposite charges attract. Okay, so if you have, for example, um, two aspartates next to each other, two aspartates next to each other, you've got um, carboxyl group there, carboxyl group here, these negative charges, they're gonna repel, they're gonna wanna be kind of away from each other. Okay, they're not gonna come closer to each other because they're like charges. However, if you have an aspartate Next to a lysine, we have a carboxyl group here and an amino group here. Then that negative charge and that positive charge are going to be attracted to each other and they'll kind of come together. So here we've got two residues, a glutamate and a lysine. Glutamate's negatively charged, lysine's positively charged. So these guys are attracted to each other. So they're gonna hold this region of the protein together. Now, if I zoom back out, uh, all those residues that are highlighted in blue are capable of participating in electrostatic interactions. So, uh, basically, maybe these two are just sort of holding this local region of the protein together, but there's a cumulative effect across the entirety of the protein when it comes to electrostatic interactions holding the entire structure together. Okay, and so um, that's basically when it comes to electrostatic interactions, just the idea that charges will either attract or repel. Okay. And so, um, and again, we're talking about the side chain specifically. Okay. Um, next up is uh, disulfide bonds, disulfide bridges. 
So cysteine residues near each other can form uh, covalent bonds, covalent um, disulfide bonds. Okay. So if you have uh, two cysteines next to each other, they have these thiol groups, these SH groups. And so what can happen is that they can come together and form a, a covalent bond between them. Okay. And that is the disulfide bond or disulfide bridge. Okay. That's what that is. Okay. Now that's important because that covalent bond there, that's hence these little stars. Um, that's the only interaction as far as tertiary structure that's actually covalent. The rest of these guys, hydrophobic interactions, hydro hydrogen bonds, electrostatic interactions, those are all non-covalent interactions. Okay. Now, um, that happens, that forms, the, that disulfide bridge that forms, forms in an oxidizing environment. Okay, so there's an oxidation reaction which will remove uh, these hydrogens to give that disulfide bridge. Okay, so here we've got the protein RNase A, and in it we've got this disulfide bridge here between cysteine 40 and cysteine 95, and this disulfide bridge is important in holding the entire protein structure together. And this entire protein, of course, is made up of just one polypeptide, but um, this specific disulfide bridge is important in holding this localized region together, as well as being important to the overall protein structure. Now, um, now that we know what holds together tertiary structure, just a quick note on what can actually disrupt these different interactions. Okay, so when it comes to hydrophobic interactions, detergents, detergents, um, disrupt hydrophobic interactions. And we'll talk more about uh, denaturation or, and disruption of, disruption of protein structure later uh, in another another video in the series. Okay, or hydrogen bonds, they're disrupted by heat or by molecules that can hydrogen bond extensively. And we'll kind of see what that means later. Um, electrostatic interactions, electrostatic interactions are uh, disrupted by pH changes because of course pH changes uh, will determine whether or not certain groups are protonated uh, or deprotonated, and that can have an impact on whether they're charged or not, and uh, what charge they have, and um, that that's going to, of course, impact um, whether groups are attracting or repelling, or attracting or repelling less or more. Um, heavy metals, heavy metals are always um, uh, metals are typically um, cations, right? They're positively charged. And uh, they basically are attracted to um, negatively charged side chains, and they're repelled by positively charged side chains. Okay, um, disulfide bonds or disulfide bridges—they're disrupted by reducing agents. So reducing agents basically um, get the reverse reaction to go. So if you add a reducing agent here, um, that disulfide bridge will break up into those separate thiol groups. Okay. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, about protein denaturation later in the series. But I hope that video was helpful as far as tertiary structure goes. Thanks for watching.